Welcome to episode 200 of the Barcelona Podcast, home to the most influential voices in the FC Barcelona community, brought to you by the Blue Wire Podcast Network and sponsored betonline.ag. Hit that subscription button to be first to listen to the hottest takes on the biggest stories coming out of the Camp No. I'm Dan Hilton, and I am again joined by Frances Tomas, Barca columnist featured on ESPN, Barca Blog, and many others. Frances, not used to talking to you twice a week, but we were just too excited to get to episode 200, or actually Barca won yesterday. And it's Messi's birthday today. So we have to take in Whoa. all that positivity before we remember that Barca may not be champions and Messi is 33 years old. Hola, Gules. Um, yeah, I, I was fairly happy when you started recording, but you put a downer on that at the end. Um, but I'm not going to let you do that. I am super excited to be recording 200 episodes today. Um, we have had people listening to us from the very beginning and I've got no idea how they're still here. Well, on today's show, we will be recapping Barca against Athletic Club. Yesterday, we are going to be discussing the rumor about Artur leaving that just keeps on heating up. And maybe we're going to be talking a little bit about hitting 200. So first things first, though, Frances, talking about yesterday, Barcelona's 1-0 win over Athletic. Big names in the YouTube review I had last night. Ricky Puj, Anzu Fati. Okay, even Rakitic had a goal, but it's a youth revolution at the camp. No. Well, yeah, 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 it's a new revolution as much as Kike Setien allows it to be. Um, <laughs> I think that he's got players that can change games. Um, I think that the game against Bilbao, um, not because we won it, because really we could have drawn or even lost that. Um, it just, you know, it came out to Ivan Rakitic, who pretty much flopped in the previous game. I know we debated that in the previous episode. We, I strongly recommend our listeners go back and listen to it if they haven't. Um, but no, absolutely. I think Setien um, now has no choice but to play the youngsters. Um, having a game every 72 hours shows that fitness and freshness and hunger is uh, a quality that not everyone in the dressing room does have at this moment in time. And uh, I do expect changes from the very beginning. Yeah, I feel like all I needed for Fatih and Puj was almost to have the numbers back things up. Again, I've been a huge advocate for Ricky Puj and I've wanted him to get time because I felt like Obviously, he was going to be a big role for me, at least in the future of the club down the road. But uh, even though his defensive positioning isn't always perfect, what he provides offensively, we now have, uh, because he got a more of an extended run out, playing about 25, 35. Well, he played 35 minutes, Fadi gets 25. But in that 35 minutes, the numbers are there that Barca were just better when he was on the field. Expected goals, which is an important stat and gets more important, it seems like, year after year. The expected goals for Barca in the 65 minutes before Ansu Fati and Puj were on the pitch, 0.30. Expected goals for Barca in the 25 minutes when Ansu Fati and Puj were on the pitch together, 1.59. What they simply added was that when Puj became the fulcrum in the middle of that attack, Barca started moving the ball. And that allowed them to widen the pitch a bit and stretch out that 5-3-2 of Athletic Club when they were defending. And Ansu Fati because of his willingness to continue to go at defenders, stretch the pitch out, which was so important to just getting Messi the space required. And it was just so cool to see. And I say cool as an almost the wrong adjective there, but it was cool to see that Messi had the space. Even I, I noticed in the last 10 minutes of the match, there was a moment when Messi was completely isolated out on the right wing and he checks to the ball, fakes out the defender and gets a wide open sprint down the right wing on a ball that Nelson Semedo was able to get to him. It didn't lead to anything after that, but I was wondering when that happened. I went, how is Messi in a one-on-one -on -one situation alone on the right wing in the last 10 minutes of a match? And that was because just a few minutes earlier to that, Ansu Fati took on two defenders on the left wing. They had to bring that help and slide an extra one of those back five over to Ansu Fati because he just kept going at them. And you do have to respect the speed and willingness he has to go directly at defenders. And then again, the other part of that was Ricky Puj, just moving the ball quicker. As silly as that was, moving the ball quicker. And even the goal, credit on Rakitic for being there, continuing his run. But the reason Rakitic continued that run in the box was because Puj started that whole sequence with a direct ball straight up the middle to Vidal. And then Rakitic, a few moments later, when Messi was in the box and that ball was just bouncing around, that direct ball in 
was able to kind of get the defense on its back heels. So when Barca continued to try to take chances in, Vidal had a little chance there. The ball finally gets to Messi, and he finds Rakitic. But Rakitic, because Puj had already supported that run, was able to make the run in that he could just continued on, that he should always be doing into the box. And Rakitic usually doesn't do that. So all of those things happened because those two young players came on, and we can actually see that Barca were unequivocally better because the two of them were playing. For me, it's very clear. Um, there was a very, very clear example when Ricky Puj didn't respect the hierarchy that obviously has been instilled in the dressing room for so many years and, and it's what stops us from moving on. Um, Messi walked towards the corner kick. Uh, Ricky Puig was going to take it. Messi walked towards it and, you know, 99 times out of 100, if that's anybody else taking the corner, they just give the ball to Messi and they start doing little one-twos from the side. Ricky Puig just took the corner um, all the way to the goalkeeper um, or towards the goalkeeper. And, and that was a bit of a change. Uh, I know it's minor, I know it's little, but it is very telling that these youngsters, both Fatih and Ricky Butch, they certainly don't respect those hierarchies and they're here to make an impact. Um, as you mentioned, Ricky changed the game immediately. Um, he wasn't messing around. He wasn't best passing the ball horizontally. He wasn't controlling and awaiting and being cautious. He was just going for it. And, uh, you know, that, that in the past has been used as a detriment to him. But he was also very aggressive when recovering balls. And, I think in the next match, considering that the young is injured and Sergio Roberto, um, if he's fit, he's probably going to go to the right back position. I think Ricky Butch is, is now a starter or should be. Uh, he changed the rhythm of the game. Um, he was not always running desperately forward. He's shown that composure. And I think that, you know, he deserves a spot in the starting 11, as I um, wrote down in my article in Barca blog before the game even started. And the other one that we've talked about is Ansu, Ansu Fati. Um, he was much, much, much more influential than Griezmann. And I don't think anyone here argues that he was much more purposeful than even Braithwaite would have been or when he came in. Um, he does deserve to start as well. I don't think it's even really a debate anymore. Um, when we've got matches coming so short after one another, I think both youngsters have to start. And it's not just, you know, let's trust La Masia because, you know, they're one of our own, etc. which obviously does play a part as well. It's just, given the players we've got at our disposal right now, they should be in the first 11. It's as simple as that. Right, and I don't think there's a big, big change, right? I don't want this one individual game to create all these narratives, but the narrative from this game that should be taken was that Barca needed something. They do need some energy, and that is the whole point that, you know, again, I always credit Kevin Williams because he's been trumpeting this for now going on about two and a half seasons, that Barca's legs are just too old. And that's not a bad thing because that also means experience. And it means that they understand where to be defensively and they just have a rock solid defense. I want to credit this real quick. Ter Sagan has kept five league clean sheets and for the first time in his career, in a row rather. And then Barcelona have kept five La Liga clean sheets in a row for the first time since 2015-16. So the defense is solid right now. And where I want to give credit to Kike Setien is that he has found ways to put this veteran team who should be getting caught out on the counter time and time again because they're just not that fast. But Gerard Piquet was awesome in that game yesterday. And I, we haven't heard anything about the injury so far, that he, uh, the, the groin that seemed to be acting up late. But hopefully he's healthy because he was awesome yesterday. And then Sergio Busquets, especially in that first half, I thought he was the best player on the field. Not too many compliments to give out for the first 45 minutes, but I thought Busquets was really terrific just in his positioning and not even offensively. But just defensively, uh, he had that, that basically that goal-saving tackle in that first half as well out on the counter. So Busquets was awesome, and the Barcelona defense has been really great. And that is a credit to Kike Setien for molding the team to not get beat with the counters. However, you're seeing offensively that if you have a team, and as much as you want to say about Griezmann, my problem with was with Luis Suarez yesterday. Where And this is the man management where you can critique Kike Setien on. He played 90 minutes, that being Luis Suarez, a few days before. Why is he again playing 90 minutes in this one? It just doesn't make sense for man management. And it was frustrating to me. And again, this is just personality. If you're going to be a top professional footballer, you've got to have an edge, especially if you're a striker. You kind of have got to be an ornery guy. You might not be looking like you might be so liked, but... I said this on the, in the YouTube video as well. He seems to me like when I play pickup basketball, which unfortunately I haven't been able to do with, with COVID, but when I play pickup basketball, there always seems to be an older guy there who sometimes is a dad and it's fine that he's there. 
because that guy could ball back in the day and he's a great player then and he's still got a lot of the same tools now. But because he can't really get up and down the court so much, he just likes to shoot a three every time you give him the ball or he'll constantly yell ball, ball, ball and then drive into traffic when everybody's around him. And that's why I felt with Luis Suarez yesterday. He looked like he was injured in the first 10 minutes of the match. And just going on that, as much space as he does create, you, if he's not hitting a, a banger in, if he's not really just crushing the ball, putting his laces through it, and scoring this miraculous goal out of nothing, then you kind of question why he's still just trotting out there and yelling at his teammates. There was a moment, I, I think in the first 35 minutes of the match, where Arthur wasn't able to get the ball back to him, and Luis Suarez yelled at Arthur, and Arthur yelled back, well, you have to check to the ball. And he, had, and he was right. That was the argument, was that you can't yell at me for not finding you if you're not going to check back to the ball when you have the man in front of you. And that was the argument that it's almost an impossible angle to play. Yeah, so I was really frustrated with Suarez, but we also understand why he's playing 90 minutes because he's been deemed fit and he says, I'm playing and Messi probably has given him the backing and that's why that's happening. So as much as you want to get upset about Griezmann, I think Luis Suarez was the thing that really worried me and frustrated me yesterday. Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think it's very, very, very clear because, you know, Setien said it in the press conference before Sevilla that, Luis Suarez is not fully fit. But then when you know that and you announce that to the media, they're playing him for 175 minutes straight. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, we do know that the best Luis Suarez must be aggressive. Um, and when he is aggressive, it's because he's got 100% of his capabilities there. And, and he just doesn't have that. He's obviously tired. Um, I do understand that Setien respects the hierarchies of the dressing room. I don't, I don't abide by it. I don't buy it. I don't want it, but that's what Piqué Setien is trying to do. And I just think it's very obvious he should be rested. I mean, with these key players, and I do include Suarez, but obviously Busquets, Piqué, Alba, etc. We need to be grateful for what they have done in the past, but we need to hold them accountable for what they're doing today. And what they're doing today, especially in Suarez's case, is just not good enough. Right. It's not all of them, right? And that's what we've been saying. Since the break came back, it's not just Jordi Alba's age. Jordi Alba has been awesome and has deserved to play a full 90 and has put Junior Firpo on the bench because of his performances. Gerard Piquet the same way. You can worry about getting Araujo some time, but Piquet has deserved to play the full 90. He's been awesome since his comeback. Busquets has been the same way. I think he's under Kike Setien, the guy who we've seen night and day from the Valverde time. But there are guys like Rakitic who had a, a struggling game a midweek or rather uh, over the weekend against Sevilla. And then you have Arturo Vidal, who just really hasn't been good enough in the last two games. And then Suarez, who was much better against Sevilla. I thought even he was fine. But then you look at what he did against Athletic Club and there were problems. And Messi, as much as he didn't have a messy day yesterday and he seemed to be just a little bit off, it's just it's incredible to me because then you actually see the stats after the game. This is the 10th La Liga game this season in which Messi completed more dribbles than the entire opposition. 10 dribbles completed successful for Messi to just six from Athletic Club. So as much as you might think that Messi didn't have a great day, he just continues to just do things that an opponent doesn't do. In that first half was Barca's only option. And I think when you say that Fati and Puj aren't okay with the hierarchy, I think they're just playing the way that you're taught to play in the academy that no one player is greater than the others. And to help a great player, you have to put them in positions to succeed. And again, that's where we go all the way back to what the positivity was from this match. That it, I think that the word I kept seeing was naivety. And I don't think it's naivety from fans to say that Puj and Fati were willing and fearless to move the ball in the proper ways, in the way that Barca should be playing, right? That we got to see it for 35 minutes, that they were playing the quote-unquote Barca way. And what that does, it alleviates pressure from Messi. It puts him in spaces to succeed. It gives him opportunities to have less pressure and less than five defenders constantly around him every time he touches the ball. Because the other big point was, again, I, in the YouTube video, I, I called this out, that there were moments when this is also a disservice to Griezmann. Barca front three, in particular Messi, Suarez, and Griezmann, were all in a space of about 15 to 20 yards of each other. And that's fine if you have those small passes and you can open things up out wide, but there was no one then out wide. Alba hadn't made the run forward yet. There was nobody out wide to dink a one-two and then switch the ball to. 
right? You'd see so many times with Messi and Xavi going all the way back there where they would get almost right on top of each other, try to shake hands, but really they were just doing a one-two pass to allow the other one to switch the field. But there was no player to switch the field to. Even Semedo had this counterattack in the first half where he winds up cutting in. Unfortunately, Griezmann, Suarez, and Messi were all also in the middle of the field and kind of converging on this space. And then the counterattack just completely breaks down. Barca passes around the penalty box for, you know, about 15, 20 passes. And then eventually, Athletic Club is either either to cut something out or they make Messi turn the ball over. And that happened time and time again. And then the youngsters come on and things change. Frances, before you do respond to that, I just want to hit the ad break real quick. So, Frances, we look forward, and against Sevilla, it seemed like Barca just weren't good enough. Do you feel like there could still be a title race if personnel was chosen properly? I would say the title is still on, yes. Um, but I think it's more likely that Barca don't win all their games and points than there is of Madrid not doing so. Um, in, in other words... I think Barca are their own worst enemy at this moment in time because I don't think they quite know what they're playing at. Um, I think Kike Setien was brought in order to change, um, to, to make an improvement into what Valverde had been doing until that point. Uh, we cannot forget that the players were fairly happy to have Valverde and coast along with his, um, his mechanisms, his formations, etc. Um, the board thought differently and so did the vast majority of the fan base, to be honest. But, you know, what Setien has brought has been quite disappointing to date. I'm not saying that it won't change. I'm not saying that it won't get better. But until now, Barca don't really know what sort of game are they playing. I mean, is Barca an addition of great individuals or is Barca a collective in which the collective is more important? Um, the change needed hasn't, hasn't come. The ball is flowing too slowly. The purpose is still lacking. Um, we're not quite able to work out in, in this case, the midfield, Messi is the only one that can do this. And obviously, Ricky Puch when he comes on. But the rest of the players don't seem to be able to read when this final pass can go through. Um, they keep losing their positions, especially in attack. In defence, as you said, is quite solid, so that's not bad. But and, and that in attacking, especially overlapping, etc., the positions have been you know, occupied. Um, I don't think the... I think that the, the width of the pitch is decent. I think it has been better. Both Alba's been all right. It wasn't that great in the last game. But um, Semedo and Roberto in the first game after the Kobe break was actually quite good as well. But I don't think they're going deep enough. And Barca without very deep runs in the overlap from the wings are just not as effective as they should be. The subs seem to be pre-planned all the time. Um, it looks like, you know, Setien just comes up with a sheet of paper two, three hours before the game. And then whatever happens in the game, he sticks with that. That's not what I remember him doing at Betis, to be honest. And that's not why... Myself and so many other Barca fans around the world wanted Setien to come and change things. Um, he's not able to react. And I do think that, as we have been mentioned, a shake-up is needed. And otherwise, the team will continue to struggle against opponents that just have two, three, four players at the heart of defense and, in a way, pile up on Messi whenever he's got the ball. There needs to be more flow. There needs to be more variety. And I just don't think we will win La Liga playing like this. Not because of the referee and uh, conspiracy that Piquet referred to, which, you know, may play a factor as well. Not because of Real Madrid winning the matches, but just because I don't think we will. But having said all that, the last five, six, seven minutes in the last game against Bilbao were better. That's what we need to see on a consistent basis in order to have a chance of lifting the title again. Yeah, I like what you said about the width. And I just want to be very clear tactically that he's having the fullbacks, that being Semedo and Alba, largely stay at home. We're actually seeing Alba stay at home a bit more than he's used to. Now, he was able to get forward as the match went on against Athletic Club as it opened up just a little bit. But yeah, if Alba and Semedo are going to stay at home, because again, it all goes back to the same ideas that Barza are an aging squad. And so their midfielders, if they're all over the age of 30, as it was against Sevilla with Vidal, Rakitic, and Busquets starting. If you have an older midfield like that that just doesn't have the uh, makeup, the ground speed that they used to against a counterattack, you've got to keep your fullbacks deeper and not allow them to really get deep and get completely to the opposing goal line. And so that means that your wingers, that being in this one, started Griezmann, and we know that Messi 
especially if he's dropping deep to receive the ball, is not going to be stretching out on the right wing. So it puts more responsibility on Semedo. But if, <laughs> but if it, right, I keep saying but, and it seems like there's a lot of if-then statements because if Messi is going to be in the middle of the field, that means that in theory, Semedo should be the one making that run all the way to the opposing goal line to stretch out the field. But he has to stay at home because the midfield and the center backs, uh, that being Gerard Piquet at least, are much older. So you can't take Semedo away from trying to cut out the counterattack. He's bought one of the quickest two, three guys on the entire field, for, at least for Barca. And so you can't take him away from his defensive duties to put him up there to stretch the field on the right wing. And then on the other side, if Alba's going to stay home, you need Antoine Griezmann to be stretching on the left side. But he's not really doing that because he's a player that doesn't really fit in that you know 1v1 winger on the, on the side. He has to come in check to the ball and try to combine in the middle of the field as basically a secondary striker in a 4-3-3, which is a position that doesn't exist. So you see how one problem that you try to solve, you can't really solve that one problem without bringing up something else. Now, fortunately, Frankie de Jong and his ability to move the ball is a little helpful in stretching a team out, but you see how lacking, sorely lacking the team is without him on the field in the midfield, at least. And then another one of those midfielders, and there's a great transition to this, Artur, uh, for all that people were excited about and have said that he keeps possession so much so so well since he showed up at Barca, I don't really have too many compliments to add to that. And you have to wonder that even yesterday, if he had some some rumors and he may have had some diarios in the back of his head. Well, um, I know I'm not in the majority here. I can sense it by reading the comments in the Barcelona podcast private group on Facebook. Um, as people know, I'm not on Twitter or on Instagram or anything like that because, you know, it's just too much. <laughs> Too much trolling and pressure and, and, and nonsense going on in there. Um, but honestly, 80 million euros for Artur, I would take it. I would put him in the box myself and I would do the lace and deliver it to Italy myself. I will even pedal it all the way through. 80 million euros for a player that in three years has either been injured or recovering from injury or adapting to the football game again in terms of pace, etc., because he wasn't fully fit and then gets injured again, 80 million euros. I mean, what are we talking about here? That's a huge lot of money. Um, that's pretty much the whole of, of Lautaro Martinez coming over. I, I think it's a no-brainer. However, there's something hidden in here, and it's the fact that but the Barca board needs 70 million euros so that their accounts at the end of the year, um, you know, break, at least break even. So what I'm pretty sure is happening here is that they're selling Artur for 80 million. They're going to have the Assemblea for, for the year, the Assembly for the year with the sources, etc. The accounts are going to be passed because they will be on a superavit, which is a plus in terms of profit. Then they're going to use, I, I would say, 70 million euros out of that to buy Pianic. So basically we've sold a 23-year-old player who I don't think is amazing yet. I think he's got skills and potential to eventually be because that's why i'm saying that 80 million is a fair price and i think it's a great price for barca to sell him for but then if the if the catch up for that is to get a 30 year old player who could be good you know i don't think he's going to be as good as Artur would potentially become and get a profit of 10 million i think that makes no sense so there's a bit of a caveat in there and that's that's why i'm not fully happy about the situation because i think that we're going to end up with pianic plus 10 instead of just 80. Exactly. Right. That, 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 there, there it is, is that Pjanic at 30, sure, he's going to be an experienced, good midfielder, but he's going to be on high wages, too. It's just another Galactico. And I will say it with a negative connotation. It's just another idea of a Galactico coming in. And you're right that 23 year old Arter has not, as I always say, progress is not linear. And he has stagnated, unfortunately, and it has been fitness issues. And I think that Barca is saying, well, yeah, if he's valued at 80 million, then sure, but that's a whole problem that he's going to go for 80 million and then you're going to use 70 million of it or so, which is an overvaluation of, of Pianic. So Arter might be overvalued, but so is basically what the guy that's going to be a swap deal. And Arter is going to make tons more on his weekly wages and it's going to continue to perpetrate this issue about players getting inflated weekly wages over and over again. But that's that, that'll be Juventus's problem because Pianic is going to ask for high wages that are basically going to offset Arter's. So it seems like this deal is done completely between the clubs, much like Rakitic to, e to Inter Milan. However, the player does have the final say because he still has a contract. And the only way that that would change in Spain is unless the release clause is paid, which for Arthur is quite high and Juventus isn't interested in doing that. So this hasn't happened yet. 
and we could see it linger on, but it seems like the reports from the right people, uh, and again, sources do matter, so you are getting it from the right people, though, that should be trusted, that this one seems to be very, very close to being over the finishing line, and yeah, I guess if, again, the positive is that Artur is a player that's probably going to be sold for more than he's worth, but, you know, I, I just, I don't like that idea. I think it's, I think it's just, it's upsetting and frustrating that Barca were trying to build this project. And once again, we look at it over and over and over again. Once again, in the last four or five years, the player that leaves is the player that is younger, that potentially still has some room to grow, but is at the moment just not up to snuff where he can be trusted by a manager. So once again, it's the younger player. It's not Rakitic, it's not Vidal, because... Nobody was willing to take on their contracts and take on their wages, and the players weren't willing and agreeing to leave Barcelona quick enough. So instead of those players, once again, it's the younger player who's going to fetch you the, the larger amount. And it's why, at the beginning of this summer, Nelson Semedo was that first name that was popping out. So I expect Nelson Semedo to stay at the club now, but all that said, I think the reason Nelson Semedo was the first name we were talking about because he was a player that they tested the market, and he still seemed to have value. And you even the player we didn't mention was Coutinho. Now you have play, you have Kules basically talking themselves back into Coutinho because Kules have accepted that Coutinho is not going to be worth anything close to what he's valued at on the market, especially with the pandemic. So all things as far as the, the monetary way that the club is trying to recover, you know that financially they're in a bad way. And clearly you watch 90 minutes of Luis Suarez or 180 straight minutes of Luis Suarez. Well, he didn't play 180 minutes, but you get my point. And you, you see him play all this time and you go, wow, a number nine who was a little more mobile would be quite helpful. But they have their eyes only on the Toro Martinez. Timo Werner is already at Chelsea and the other options are going to start to weed out. And, you know, it's just it's frustrating because I'm not saying that this board needs to be replaced in 2021 because it, it might be the Bartomeu, we'll say the Bartomeu candidate that winds up getting the presidency and splitting the votes of Victor Font and and Juan Laporta. So you don't know who's going to be president uh, next summer, but it does always beg the question when you hear this kind of stuff, you go, it just seems like this is a board and people making decisions, even Eric Abidal and Kike Setien, they are making decisions for right now, for June 24th, 2020, and next week, and the next two weeks. That is what they are making decisions for, for a La Liga that is going to be difficult. And I know Messi just turned 33, but they're just thinking about what is happening right now and almost disregarding the fact that of what we just saw and talked about in the first segment, that Puj and Fati, they don't necessarily just have to be the future, that Barca needs some legs. They need something. And they have Pedri and Trincao, and I, I, I almost keep forgetting about them. I can't forget about these young players that are coming in. But that doesn't mean that Artur next year when he's 24 years old wouldn't be a, fa a good foundation, almost veteran piece at that point. Yes, um, you mentioned all the names that I was going to mention, and I do agree. I think Busquets and the young will be midfielders of Barca next year. I think no one's doubting that. Rakitic, if it was up to me, he would be sold. But obviously, he's got different ideas, not the club, because as you mentioned, they are trying to shop him out. But no, he wants to finish his contract and go to Sevilla for free, I'm sure. Um, Artur, as I said, 80 million is great. If not, then bringing Pjanic in, I think, makes very, very little sense, ne next to no sense. Not because of the value, which is also, in my eyes, nonsensical. I think is the fact that he will take playing time away from the names you mentioned. Alanya should be coming back, really, because he's got more than enough quality to at least be a squad player, a challenge for, for a starting spot. Ricky Puch, considering what he's doing right now, I know he will most probably do in the next 10 games. He's a first-team player as well. Pedri has been impressive in Las Palmas, and to be honest, Segunda División is just far too small for him. He has to come to the first team. And then Trincao, I know that he is playing as a winger in Portugal, but I think within the Barca system, he may even be slotted as, a, as an interior, um, an interior midfielder. Vidal is not going anywhere either. I don't think anyone's going to pay his wage. So that's a huge lot of midfielders. And if you can get 80 million for the one that basically doesn't seem to be able to pass a ball forward, then that's not a bad deal. Right. Yeah, it does seem musical chairs that Artur is the odd man out here moving forward if Rakitic and Vidal aren't willing to to leave the club. And yeah, it, it, so it's a frustrating thing, but it, it's it's interesting to me that his performance yesterday kind of talked people in, where last week you just saw the response that nobody wanted to see Arthur leave, and now he has one bad showing yesterday. I mean, I think he's been fine. I, I Even even yesterday, I thought he was fine, but now people have all turned on him. But that's the thing. 
that's the thing. We cannot be that reactive as fans. I know mean, everyone's got the right to say whatever, of course, and it's free, free speech, whatever. But we cannot base the future of a player in one game. You know, like I was reading even the comments on, on the TV, TV pod private group that we've got on Facebook. And as soon as the news of Artur Goen erupted, there were comments like, oh, this board, they don't know what they're doing. And, you know, this is horrendous. You log back in in eight, nine, ten hours, and it's the complete opposite. I mean, we need to have some perspective here, people. We, we, we've been doing this podcast for three years. For better or worse, we've seen Artur from the very first day, and we've been discussing Artur from the very first day he was in our, in our club. He's never really got any better. And, and, you know, just because he can't play 90 minutes properly uh, against Athletic Bilbao, I don't think that's a decisive, um, a decisive final straw. It needs to be a continuation of what the player has offered. And to be honest, and this is the, the flip of the question, would you buy Artur for 80 million euros right now? No, never, not in a million years. So if you can sell it for that money, then it's good business. Yeah, but it goes back to the whole thing. It's a sick legal argument we're having, but you're not really, you're, you might be getting rid of him for 80 million one week, but we know that this is, there's a 95% chance that Pianic is coming for a large amount of money. So you're really only getting rid of a 23 year old for 10 million euros, right? Like when all is said and done and, and we don't, I mean, should we truly care about the money or, I mean, I, yeah, I'm glad they're balancing the books, the books so they don't wind up getting hit by FFP and getting another transfer ban because we know, <laughs> we see that, uh, I know it was Kubo's choice, but at Real Madrid or at Mallorca at the moment, we see what that transfer did, what that transfer bed ban did to Barca back then. I, I know Suarez and Der Stegen came that summer to make everything everything well, but yeah, I mean, it seems like Barca are just scrambling and they you, you see that they've been out in the market, that TT didn't work out, that Coutinho is not fetching the right price, that Rakitic and Vidal don't want to leave. And you just see that Barca are they, they're in a they're in a box they're in a, a prison of their own making and that is unfortunate to see for the club that we love but I hope that there are people at the club that continue to be saying the right things and I I do hope that the scouting that they've done whether it's Pedri or Trincao and, and some of the younger players that the eye for talent is still there Barca as much as they also uh, they got rid of so much of their scouting department a few weeks ago as well that they said wasn't COVID related but they got rid of so much of their scouting department so now there's even less eyes to to catch talent but the only talent that Barca continues to really rely on and see is now 33 years old so this is kind of what we'll, the last segment we'll wrap up the show with I don't know if there's much else to say 33 years old Messi is today he was 29 when we started this show Frances and it seems like uh, everyone's on the same page here you have to savor every hour every minute he's on the field he's just the most special player that we've ever seen and I even said to my wife yesterday it's incredible to me that I am I was born within four years of the or three well rather three years I was born within three years of the greatest player ever to lace up a pair of boots and that is pretty special and I've been very lucky to see him in the way that I have of course and also the fact that he's played all of his career for Barca um we can actually witness history being made um I don't really know what else to say about Messi I mean everything that you could possibly say has been said he's the best player to ever play the game um I know there's debates with Maradona, Pelé, etc. But to be honest, they didn't win in terms of club football uh, even a tenth of what Messi is achieving. And they didn't play with the consistency that Messi has been doing week in, week out for 16 years now. Um, I think anyone who's basically played against him understands that the caliber of a player that he is, everyone who's played with it, um, they whenever they talk to anybody else, they would be saying, yep, I played with Messi when I was when I was active, when I was an active footballer. And yeah, he's just he's just fantastic. And to see the amount of willingness, the amount of um, energy that he brings to every single game, despite the fact that the people around him and the managers around him haven't necessarily, in my eyes, been as effective as, as he deserves to make him win. Because, you know, let's not forget, he hasn't won a Champions League for nearly five years now. I think that's a detriment to his legacy. And I, that's why I keep saying we need to win and we need to win now. And, you know, I do worry about the future, but I think that until Messi's time is over, you need to do everything within your power to bring the best players around him and to give him the best managers and, and etc. in order to make him succeed in the collective even more. But obviously what he's won already is, is legendary. Right. And that's at the heart of the problem too, that they've 
tried to do their best to bring the best players to put around him and available around him. But that also means that you had to pay those players what they thought they were worth in terms of weekly wages and the transfer fees. And so to try to bring the best players in around him, the club has, again, kind of put themselves in a position where if those guys haven't lived up, they've had a hard time moving them on for reasonable prices. And now they're, again, they're in a problem of their own making as Messi continues to age. So things look bleak. But also remember where we started this show that Barca still have Messi and he still looks like the best player in the world at 33. He's, I would say, already continuing to be the favorite for the Ballon d'Or. Now, we know that if Barca don't win the Champions League, they don't win the Liga, the individual titles will not come for Messi because he is the best player in the world every year. And the committees and all the voting and the politics just, they need Messi to not get the team trophy so that he winds up not getting the individual award either. And we know that's how that works. But yeah, he's 33, still the best player in the world. So for Barca to just add some legs, add some energy, and add some help to him would be great. And I think that's a perfect transition, Frances, to the final thing that we're going to talk about is that we have hit 200. And I would have not and you would have not gotten to 200 without some major help as well. Of course. I mean, we started this project, this the Barcelona podcast project, when podcasting really wasn't known in Europe at all. Um, if you just basically call me one day or I called you or something, and uh, we just said, right, let's let's just start doing this because um, we just want to talk. I have been blogging and writing about Barca, ESPN, Barca blog, etc. for around seven or eight years already. Um, but I was getting tired of just writing all the time because I had much more to say and I didn't have a space to say it. And then obviously pairing up with you, with your expertise, um, not just in Barca, but also producing and, and, and editing, etc. It was, you know, <laughs> I don't want to get too emotional here, but a match made in heaven. Uh, apparently that's what our listeners think as well. So, yeah, it's just been a great experience um, talking to you over three years. There was a year in the middle that when I moved to Qatar that I just couldn't make it. And you kept it going, especially with the help of some fantastic Barca lovers around the world. And it will hit 200. It's not just thanks to me, certainly not. It's thanks to you as the main driver of the podcast and obviously all the people that listen to us on a weekly basis, but all of those that came and, and spoke, especially during that period, and keep coming up as guests when we can. Yeah, I agree. I, I think the when you talk about just you and I working together, again, not getting too, too sappy or anything, but people know that, and I think you can hear this, that we are just different personalities, that I may go on my my, my rare rants, but one of us is a, a go-getter that's willing to take risks and try things, and the other one is kind of just, you know, we'll say the, the worker bee that does his homework and makes sure that he's uh, dotted his I's and, and crossed his T's, and that's just the two personalities that wind up working together. So I do want to thank you and your family for all the time support, as well as my wife for putting up with so, so much all the time. I always kick her out, as I did this morning at 9 a.m. here on the East Coast in the U.S., kicking her out of, her home, of our home office uh, every week to record, having her set up and film the YouTube videos with me, every question about a JPEG, every idea for the show, every time that I get frustrated by Rakitic or Luis Suarez and I can't bring that nothingness to the podcast, she has to hear those rants and just a commitment to spend so many hours doing something I love doing with the patience that my wife has, that hoping that it'll continue to pay off in the future. Again, her support is, I think, paramount to this continuing. And also on barcelblog.com today, along with this episode, we are releasing our Hall of Fame with every guest we've ever had. So you can go down memory lane there. We have the current and former players we've had on, the, including Ronald De Boer, as well as Jean Piquero from the other day, Natasha and Danova in the past. We, asked, they, we had formerly of the Barcelona Femini. We've had so many journalists, authors, fellow podcasters, the Peñas. And I also want to mention by name our Barcelona podcast all-stars that, as you mentioned, kept this show going in 2018 when you were away. A special thank you most of all to those who made four appearances or more. And that crew is Alex Trujica, Barcelev, Diana Christine, Eugenia Carolee, Kevin Williams, Mike Miller, and Navid Molagai. So those are the Barcelona all-stars that have been on four or more times in these three plus years and they're the ones that really did help me get through in 2018 and helped us get to 200 even in the early going they were willing to come on give of their time and seem to care about it for for no money and just for out of the uh, kindness of their heart and their love of fc barcelona so that is what this show is always about we're not going to waste any more of your time because your time is precious and with matches every three days i know people have limited time to digest 
before the next match is going on. So a big thank you to all of them and a big thank you to you for tuning in again. You can tap in your app and check out the show notes to subscribe. You can find us on social media. We're on Twitter at the Barcelona Pod or at Health Indy 13 for me and on Instagram at the Barcelona Pod. That closed Facebook group is tbpod.link backslash group for deeper dives and discussions. And you can also help us out on Patreon to continue making these shows at tbpod.link backslash Patreon. We're also on YouTube at the Barcelona Podcast. Check us out, match reviews, all that stuff and more. Hit that subscription button as well. Like those videos. That helps out a lot. So thanks so much for listening to the Barcelona Podcast. Until next time, we'll talk to you soon. And Forza Barca. 200. Forza. 